Isaiah 55, we started out uh, last week looking at Isaiah chapter 55. How many remember that? How many of you remember Isaiah the prophet going, yo, yo, yo? Right? Isaiah 55 starts out with, with the ho. Everybody say ho. ho. Yeah, well, if, if you were writing today, if Isaiah was preaching this today or writing this today, go, yo. Pay attention. That's all it means. Pay attention. Right? Yo, listen up. At work the other day, I come out of my office, and there was a tow motor driver who I needed to get his attention. And I just stepped out of my office and right toward the main arm, yo! Yeah, right? And he stopped and he looked back. I got a big mouth, right? You know that. All that noise and everything else, he heard me above all that other stuff. He stopped, he looks back, and I'm waving him back, yo! Right? Pay attention. That's all Isaiah said. Everyone who thirsts, everyone who thirsts, come to the wall. You who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come to the waters, all who thirst. Come, buy wine and, and milk. Without money, without price. Yo, come to the water. You who hunger, you who thirst, come. He's, you know, Jesus, remember what Jesus said? In Matthew chapter 5, I believe, verse 6, Jesus says, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? Because they will be filled. Notice what else Isaiah says here. He says, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk. Without money. No money. No price. God's grace, His love, His forgiveness, it's free. It's free. You can't buy it. We can't buy it. We can't buy it by one, one uh, uh, ounce of our, our strength or one uh, uh, little bit of, of what we do or, or even by the greatest of human effort. We can't buy it. We can't earn salvation. It's total and completely his work. Not our work. It's his work. In fact, anything of ourselves in it taints it. If we're not trusting wholly on Christ for salvation, but trusting in our, in our own effort, in our own works. Remember the great apostle Paul said, uh, you know, all, all these things that he had done. And he said, what did he say about him? He said, I count them all dung. Count them all dung. Crap. They're worthless. All these things. We can't rely on, on the good that we've done. We can't rely on our family heritage. You know, I was, uh, 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 went to church all my growing up years, and I went to, the, you know, this particular church, and now, I'm, you know, my, my son and daughter goes there, and, and now so-and-so goes there, my grandkids, and, you know, all of that. The whole family generational thing, all going, you know, to the same church. We can't rely on that. That doesn't buy us salvation. You can go to church every, every Sunday, Every Wednesday night, every prayer breakfast, every whatever, whatever, whatever. And, and, and you can give. You know, you can pay your tithes. You can give. You can all of that. That won't save your soul. It's faith alone that saves our soul. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Without money, without price. Romans 6.23 says it this way. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Continue on in, in Isaiah 55 just a little bit and look at verse 6. We'll, we'll jump down to verse 6. God is, is, of course, speaking to Israel. Listen to what he says. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Seek him while he may be found. 
Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and God will have mercy on him. And let him return to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah continues in, the, in this chapter, in this uh, passage, this invitation to abundant life. This whole chapter, in, in my Bible it has a little heading. It says an, an, an invitation to abundant life. God's uh, wooing Israel back to him. He's calling the nation of Israel back to him, of course, in this Old Testament passage. But notice, notice something. As God extends this offer of abundant life and abundant grace, right smack in the middle of it, notice what he put, what we just read. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. In other words, what, what is that? It, it's a call for us to repent. Any place that, that, that the grace of God, that the favor of God, that the blessing of our Lord isn't shining through in our lives... God's calling us to something. He's calling us to this place of repentance. He's calling us to repent. He's saying, seek me. I don't know about you, but I know this. When I seek God, when I truly seek him. Now, it's one thing to say, you know, I'm seeking God, but in reality, we're seeking ourselves. We're seeking our TV. We're seeking our lounge chair. We're seeking our comfort. We're seeking our whatever else. Right? But when I truly seek God, He almost inevitably speaks to me, not about always the situation that I'm seeking Him concerning. Often what He'll do is speak to me about me. God's very, very, very interested in, in our ways of thinking. Very, very, very interested in, in how we view things, in, 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 in helping us to see and to understand how uh, the way that we act, the things that we say, the, the ways that we think, how they impact uh, others and, and different circumstances and situations. Helping us to see these things. God, when I seek God, He often, even though I might think that a particular situation is, has nothing to do with me, I'll seek Him and He'll start talking to me about me. And I'm like, God, stop. I don't want to hear about me. I want to hear about what are they doing wrong. <laughs> no, but He'll start telling me about me. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Now, I know it's hard for us to believe Hard for us to believe, hard for us to accept that what we often think about a circumstance or a situation is not the way God views it. I mean, we often think that God, God views things our way because God knows we're right. <laughs> you know? Isn't that right? God knows we're right about this. <laughs> it must be. So he must view it our way. Right? But God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts, they're not your thoughts. I mean, now we know that God is not confined to time and space the way that we are. So we know that God knows the end from the beginning. You know, because he's already been there. He's not confined to time and space in the, in the way that we are. 
He's everywhere at once. He's in the future and he's in the past, all right now, as well as in the present. He's not confined to time and space in, 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 in a sense, in the way that, that we perceive it, the way that we know it. Therefore, as surely his, his ways are above our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts than your thoughts. Now as we're entering into this, this new year, uh, you know, I, I, that's kind of what I'm giving you right now. It's kind of what we talked about last week a lot out of Isaiah 55. But as we're entering into this new year, where, where are the areas in your life that you're stuck? Are there areas of life, are there things that are going on in your life, ways that, that uh, places where you feel like you're stuck in this, in this situation, in this thing, in this whatever it may be. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's as easy to identify as, oh, I got this bad habit, I want to stop. You know, maybe it's something that's that easy to identify, or maybe it's something, you know, that you're dealing with that you're stuck in an area of life, maybe stuck professionally, stuck in a, a relationship-wise in a certain relationship in a, in a certain area in a certain way. Uh, maybe it's relationally, maybe it's financially, maybe it's professionally. All these different ways where we can be stuck. And it's like there seems to be no forward movement even though we know, even though we know that we're not fulfilling our God-given destiny. Anybody else feel like that? I'm not, I'm not, right now I can tell you this, you know, is not the God-given fullness of the God-given destiny for this church. It's not. I know it's not. You can't convince me otherwise. So, how are we stuck? Why are we stuck? Let me tell you, he ain't the problem. And you're not either. If we're stuck, it's probably because of me, somewhere. And, 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 and uh, I'm probably the one that has to get with God and, and, and hear the instruction on how to deal with it. So, where are you stuck in your life? Where are you stuck? What's troubling you and bothering you that bothered you in 2013, that bothered you in 2012, and bothered you in 2011, and maybe further back than that? Where are you stuck? No, just... Let, let God answer it for you. <laughs> let the Lord answer in your life. Let the Lord answer in your heart. And you get your pen out and start making some notes. Start writing it down because God wants you to deal with it. Where are you stuck? Where are you stuck? His ways are not our ways. When we, when we start to think about these things, we start to pray about these things, and we start to ask God what, what's going on, how can we change this situation. Maybe we're interceding for a loved one, maybe there's uh, health issues, maybe there's financial matters, maybe there's all, all manner of issues. We have to remember this. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. Light is more powerful than darkness. John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus Christ is that light that came into the world to give light to all men. He is that light. And light is more powerful than darkness. Truth is stronger than error. We must remember these, these things. There's more grace in God's heart than there is sin in men's hearts. There is more power in the Holy Spirit to convict men of sin than there is power in the enemy to convince us to sin. 
And there is more power in one drop of the blood of Jesus Christ than there is in, in, in power in, in all the sin of humanity from Adam and Eve to the present. The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus will take us beyond. The blood of Jesus, God's grace will take us beyond. So where then are we stuck in our lives? In those areas, we must rely on His grace. We must rely on His, 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 uh, His power to free us. Now, in, in the area you're stuck, and I hope God's identifying some of those things to us. In the area that we're stuck, I want to relate a scripture to that. Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Your life follows your thoughts. Our life will follow our thoughts. God's thoughts, however, are higher than ours. They're not ours. Listen, God has different thoughts of us. Where we fail and maybe feel like failures, he sees success. He sees blessing. He sees our, our purpose and our destiny being fulfilled. He sees us changing and becoming the man and woman of God that he desires us to be. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So is he. I mentioned Romans 12, 2 earlier. I want you to flip over there real quickly. If we want to overcome these things that have kept us bound, and maybe you've identified what some of these things are, you want to overcome them, then we must change our thinking. So, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As we believe in our hearts, the things that we are believing are setting us up in areas of life to, to become stuck, to fail, to, to struggle in certain areas of life. Almost invariably, those areas, we are believing some lies. We're believing some things that are, are not true. Now, Romans 12, 2 tells us, it says, says uh, first of all, I wanna, I'm going to read Romans. I don't like to read Romans 12, 2 without 12, 1. Paul says in Romans 12, 1, as we start there, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, you know, we can preach on that for a month. Present your body as a living sacrifice unto God. So oft times we, we, we talk about being a living sacrifice. We, uh, uh, you know, want to be a living sacrifice, but we don't present ourselves to God. We give God Sunday morning, two hours, right? The worship team, three and a half, right? You know, I, I'm half kidding, right? But do we give him our lives? Do we present ourselves to him daily at the order of worship, at the order of prayer? Do we present ourselves to Him as living sacrifices? In other words, look, does the sacrifice have any power? Now think about it. The, the little lamb was put up on the thing and slaughtered. You know, his throat was cut and the blood was spilled. Does he have any power? No. Does he have any de self-determination? None. The sacrifice was just that. 
a sacrifice. Yeah, no self-determination, no, uh, no power or ability to stop that which was about to take place or about ha was happening, etc. And Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, I beseech you, believers, I beseech you, fellow lovers of Christ, I beseech you to present yourselves as living sacrifices. In other words, offer him. Offer him. I heard it said once that no, no one can say no, Lord. So that when God says, do this, what's our portion? To obey. Present your, 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 yourselves as living sacrifices. It means to live for God. To live for Him fully, completely. Which is your reasonable service Paul says I mean you know I don't know sometimes we think it's like oh they ask too much you know they ask too much of me no Paul says it's simply your reasonable service to put yourself to death and, and, and live for him to let your desires die and, and live for him for God to be first and foremost in your life above all others. You know, listen, I know this is, this is a hard truth to buy, but he says, he who loves mother, father, husband, wife, son, daughter more than me isn't worthy of me. Jesus said that. Jesus said that. I didn't say that. That's hard to comprehend, isn't it? And my mom's here today. God bless her. Thank you for joining us today, my sister Barb. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. But isn't that, we don't, that scripture is one we don't know, isn't it? We don't remember that one very often. Now the point isn't not to love your mother or your father or your brother or your sister or your son. That's not the point. We do love them. The point is, if our love for God is not greater than our love of even our mortal family, then we're not worthy of him in his own words. That's a tough pill to swallow, isn't it? Tough for we humans to understand that fully. This is where it gets serious, isn't it? This is where it gets serious. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed. Do not be conformed to this world. We, I mentioned these ungodly beliefs that we live out of. Where do you think they come from? They come from, from this world. They come from the, the spirit of this age, Paul talks about it. About the spirit of the age. It's where it's one of the sources of our ungodly beliefs come from. How many of you were taught in, in school that you came from an ape? Y'all were. What do you think that is? Baloney. It's an ungodly belief. It's an ungodly belief, yet most of the world <laughs> operates out of it. You can't find a textbook that doesn't have it in. You can't find a, uh, you know, television programs and everything else that don't have this pre, uh, what's the word? Presupposition, if you will, that, that uh, evolution is true. Yet it's not. It's a lie. It's an ungodly belief. And our whole world is living out of it. The spirit of the age. You know, listen. If we evolve from apes, just go home. Keep your tithe. Spend it on goodies, clothing, cars, whatever you want. Don't give any money to anybody else for God's sake. We shouldn't be given any missions gifts if we came from apes. 
Why? Because if we evolved from apes, then the Bible's a lie. If Genesis 1 1's a lie, so is John 3 16. Jesus never came, never died, never rose from the dead, and our salvation is a hoax. Because the Bible says of itself, every word, every word, it's the word of God. And he is not a liar. In fact, he cannot lie. He cannot lie, the Bible says. Now, if that's not true, if that's not true, then how are we, mere mortals, to decide which is true and which isn't? Which is just a fable? <clears throat> and what's truly good for our salvation. If I believe I came from an ape, I wouldn't bother pastoring a church. I wouldn't bother because I believe in you, leading you all to hell. There'll be no, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Ungodly beliefs are any belief, decision, attitude, are you, are, are, are you, any of you have a tood? Anybody got a tood? I was all proud of my toods when I was young, you know. Right? <laughs> any belief, any decision, any attitude, any agreement, any judgment, any expectation, any vow, any oath that that does not agree with God. Now you say, well, how do we know what God agrees with? It's not hard. Really not hard. It's right here. It's really not that difficult. Anything that does not agree with God, with his word, with his nature, or with his character is an ungodly belief or expectation. An ungodly thought. An ungodly belief. I want to give you today, before we close, you know, perhaps I'll, uh, I'll give you a personal example. It's funny that I... Funny that my mom called last night and said she was going to come today because I, I was I was planning on going this direction anyhow. But then, um, but then I had another thought in mind also. And then Kevin Miller was talking to me last night down at uh, Pastor Angie's uh, uh, room down at the hospital, and what stuff that he said confirmed to me that um, what I thought the Lord was saying for today's service, and. Um, so I thought, well, okay, I'll stick with that topic, ungodly beliefs. And one of, the, one of the strongest ways or times in my own life that an ungodly belief got in, and this, I, I want to give you this personal example because this will show you how, you know, ungodly beliefs can operate in a person's life, Okay. Um, when I was 18, my father passed away. And when dad died, I, I developed an ungodly belief. Now, here was my ungodly belief, that God did that. I blamed dad's death on God. Okay? I blamed it on God. I thought it was God's fault. Okay, and that's an ungodly belief. It's an ungodly belief. Okay, but as a result of believing that, of course, I became very angry at God. You know, I was 18 years old. If ever there's a time when a young man needs a father, let me tell you, that could be a good time for it, you know. I mean, really, young men need fathers, you know, 
uh, all throughout their lives. But you know, I was 18, and, and that you know, I had I was doing okay at that point in time, in a, in a lot of regards. Um, but after my dad died, I I became very angry at God, and I blamed him. And as a result, I made some horrible decisions. Uh, I became very angry. Um, one of my ungodly beliefs, I think Billy Joel summed it up best in his, how many of you know the Billy Joel song, um, <coughs> Only the Good Die Young? You remember that song? Anybody remember that? Well, Billy Joel summed up a very ungodly belief very well in that song. Right? Um, and my life kind of took that shape, kind of took that route. You know, I went from an A and B student in college. I think, my, I think my first semester in college, I had, I think, maybe one C and three Bs and, and two A's or something. I think. I, I don't remember. I think it was a, uh, a three-something uh, GPA or whatever. I wasn't brilliant like my son who who did a 4.0 in, in his master's program. I don't know where he got that. Where did he get that? <laughs> the, uh, but I was smart enough. I was an A and B student, you know. Uh, after that, I flunked out. I flunked out, basically. You know, I mean, I quit, but I might as well have flunked out. I was getting C's and D's and, and uh, not doing very well, wasn't doing any assignments. I, got, of course, got into drugs and uh, all of that. Pretty much everything in my life kind of changed and took a, uh, a bad rap, took a bad road, you know? Um, I was horribly uh, um, insensitive to what my mom was going through. I was living in her house, living off of her, blowing my money on drugs. And that's pretty insensitive, pretty rotten to the core, pretty spoiled, living out of an ungodly belief, made a lot of bad decisions in that time period of my life, living out of an ungodly belief, blaming God for my father's death. In, the, in that time period, caused me to, to do a lot of stupid things. It wasn't God's fault. I did those stupid things. I was the dummy. You know what I mean? But I was living out of an ungodly belief. And those ungodly beliefs that we live out of, they really, really affect our lives very dramatically, very severely, very seriously affect our lives. Now you may be thinking, I, I use such a personal example and such, I think, a drastic example because I want you to think about your life. I want you to Root around in your own soul with the Holy Ghost, if you will. <laughs> Maybe that's a weird way to say it, I don't know. But I want you to think about your own life. The ungodly beliefs, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The ungodly beliefs that we form, they filter all the information that we get. And remember a little bit ago I talked about ungodly beliefs coming from the world, right? Allah and Jehovah are the same. Ungodly belief from the world. Okay? Ungodly belief from the world. God's fault that my father died. Ungodly belief, not really from the world, from my own anger, misperception of God, blaming God for that. Okay? Other circumstances, situations, we've counseled people in the past who 
I remember I, one in particular person that comes to mind that I have counseled in the past who, whose father always said, you'll never amount to anything. You're no good, you'll never amount to anything. It was just something that was always, was always said. The person lived their life with that negative expectation. Now, if the Bible is true, and the Bible says, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, imagine living your life thinking, I'll never amount to anything. Imagine. <coughs> Ungodly beliefs are formed in our, in our families, in our schools, in our homes. They're formed from places where we're hurt when things happen to us that shouldn't happen to us. They're fashioned and formed in our hearts when there's loss of loved ones. Difficult circumstances, physical traumas, ungodly beliefs can be formed and then we live out of those beliefs. One way to identify, one way to identify ungodly beliefs, where do you have fear? In what area? Where do you have fear? In what area do you experience fear? <clears throat> you probably have an ungodly belief in that area of thinking or of life. Now, I want to, I want to show you a biblical example in a sense, of ungodly beliefs. Turn to Judges chapter 6. Now, you all know this story. You can probably all tell me the story, not, not quote it to me, but you can probably all tell me the story of Gideon pretty, pretty well. But I want you to hear Gideon's ungodly beliefs. First of all, let's set the stage. Judges chapter 6, we're going to look at this and then we're uh, going to close. Judges chapter 6 in my Bible has a, has a heading. It says the Midianites oppress Israel. Look, let me tell you something. Do you feel oppressed in any area of life? Is there an area of life where you feel like I'm pressed down, I'm oppressed in this area? It's a good indication that there might be some ungodly beliefs operating in that area of your life. It's a good indication. The Midianites oppress Israel. Then the children, uh, Judges 6, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. The hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because the Midianites, the children... Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was whenever Israel had sown. Talk about a picture of oppression. Whenever Israel had sown, you know what that means, whenever they sowed a crop. Whenever they planted fields, whenever they sowed food, sowed a crop, the Midianites would come up. Also, the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth. I, I can tell you, if you feel oppressed in the area of finances, if you are struggling in finances, you almost certainly have ungodly beliefs in the area of finances. There are, are almost certain, and not that finances, it isn't difficult and isn't, uh, can be a difficult area, but the truth is most of us have some ungodly beliefs in the area of finances. 
And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Uh, and and uh, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts, both they and their camels were without number, and they would and enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel, who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I also said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now, and that last sentence is, is really a, a strong key to a lot of the Christian life. Seeking God daily and, and, and living in faith daily are dependent upon something. Our, our obedience to his voice. Our, our living in faith and walking in faith and pleasing God and walking the Christian life is, is dependent upon obedience to his voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Ebrozite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press. Now in order to hide it from the Midianites. So Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press. He was, he, now, you know, you, you do a lot of things in difficult times, but that ought to tell us something. Gideon was afraid that the Midianites would find the wheat. He was threshing wheat to hide it. He was threshing the wheat in a wine press, you know? Uh, and, 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 you know, obviously in difficult times you do what you have to do. You know, but there was such a fear of the Midianites that, that Gideon was threshing this wheat in the wine press. There's a lot of great men and women of God, I believe, hiding in wine presses. They're hiding their gifts and their talents, that not releasing them to God fully, not giving God uh, the, the the attention and and that he deserves not putting God first in their lives they're hiding in the wine press suffocating the the things that God has placed in them in the wine press I want you to see something now we've already established you know Israelites were pretty uh, um, oppressed right they're pretty beat down. They're pretty much oppressed. Gideon's hiding in the wine press, threshing wheat. And the angel of the Lord appears to him and says to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon's Gideon hiding in a wine press. Threshing wheat in a wine press. It doesn't fit. Does it? God often sees, he sees, not often, but he sees that which we are meant to be. He sees what we're capable of. He sees our, our destiny, our, our, our strength. He sees what, what we can do in him. Gideon wasn't looking like a mighty man of valor. Gideon was hiding in the wine press, threshing wheat. And God says to him, Ho, mighty man of valor! Hail, Gideon! You mighty man of valor, he says to him. God sees what's in us. He sees the future. He sees what we're capable of. He sees what we can become. And not only does he see it, he speaks it. He speaks it. He calls it forth from us. 
He calls it out, out loud. That angel didn't whisper. Hell, get in. Hey, you mighty man of God, hiding in a wine press, fresh and wheat. I got an assignment for you. No, ho, oh, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. Gideon's going, yeah, Gideon's going, whoa, whoa, chill, dude. Right? The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And this is what Gideon says to him. Oh, Lord, my Lord, my God, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, by the way, which our fathers told us about? Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Now, if you're tracking with me, even just a little bit, you ought to be able to read that sentence or two or paragraph and identify Gideon's ungodly beliefs. Or at least a few of them. Ungodly beliefs affect us about... We, we, we oft have ungodly beliefs about ourselves. Don't raise your hands, but how many of you have said, I, I'm not worthy? How many of you have said in your heart and believed, believed this, if you really knew me, you wouldn't like me? How many of you have ever said in your, in your heart, well, you know, God will heal some people, but he won't heal me. How many of you have said in your heart, well, God, God bless so-and-so, but he didn't give me any talent. He didn't give me any gifts. How many of you have said in your heart, I'll always be lonely. I'll never be accepted. I'll never be hungry. Ungodly beliefs affect us. And these are real things. Real life. Real thoughts. Ungodly beliefs affect us in our relationship with God. In our thoughts and relationship with ourselves. And in our relationships with others. Gideon's ungodly beliefs. He says, oh Lord, oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, Gideon was believing God wasn't with him. Gideon believed God had, had forsaken them, had abandoned them. Gideon had believed that God, God, well, you know, where are all his miracles? Gideon believed that God did miracles for other people but wouldn't do them for them now, here, for him. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours. Did you notice? Did you ever notice? <laughs> Did you ever notice in that sentence? Do you ever read that and you notice in that sentence? You know, Gideon just, you know, bad mouthed God. Didn't he? This kind of bad mouth God, kind of insinuated God's not with them, God abandoned them, God's that fault, God's this, God's that. The Lord just goes on. Go in this might of yours, mighty man of valor hiding in the wine press. Just goes on. Right? He just goes on and gives him instruction. Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And of course we know Gideon's response. So Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. 
I can't. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I can't. I can't learn that. I can't do that. I'll never be successful. My clan is, is the weakest in all Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. My granddaddy was poor, my daddy was poor, and I'll be poor. How many of you heard things like that? <laughs> you know? I'm unworthy, Gideon was saying. Surely, I'm the least. I'm not worthy of this. Take my cousin. Take my older cousin. He's, he's able. He's a big, strong guy. He can do it. Take him. It's Gideon's response to the, to the Lord's uh, directive. Gideon was living here out of out of, in one sense, living out of the reality of the day, but living out of some ungodly beliefs that prevented him and stopped him from believing it could change and from believing that God would, would work, and that God would move, and that God cared about Israel, and that God cares. And we operate out of the same ungodly beliefs oft times that prevent us from laying hold in faith of the promises that God has given. The promises of God. Now I hope today that God has helped you perhaps to identify some ungodly beliefs in your life. I hope today that God has helped you a little bit to perhaps see where there's some thinking. There's some thinking in our heads that needs to change. All of us. I mean, you're all human. So therefore, I know that you have some stinking thinking. That's right. I have a lot of it. <laughs> I do. <laughs> we all do. But if we truly remember it early in this, in this sermon, I asked you, where are you stuck? Where are you stuck? If you truly want to get unstuck, and we're going to have to change some of this bad thinking. And we're going to have to get some godly beliefs. And we're going to move into, in the next few weeks, we're going to move into some sermons on faith. What it is and what it ain't. He say ain't? <laughs> no. Yeah, I guess he did. <laughs> what it is and what it isn't. And we're going to Learn a little bit about faith and how to lay hold of things by faith. <clears throat> how to combat some of these ungodly beliefs and some of these ungodly thoughts that root themselves in our, in our, in our lives and cause us to, to live less than we want to live. I know for, for centuries, you know, much of the church believed it was godly to be poor. Well, let me tell you, I'm sick of being poor. And I'm not, I'm not impoverished, maybe like people in the third world or even here in America. I have a good job, et cetera, et cetera. But how come, how come it never seems to, to stretch far enough to pay the bills? And how come I can't give $100,000 to Reverend Sampson? I want to know why, God. I'd like to have that. So that he could build that school and he could put a well in every one of those Muslim villages. Why? To propagate the gospel of Christ and to show love to, to, to that area. How come? How come we can't be blessed? How, how, come, how come we got, we, we got to struggle through life, clawing and biting and nipping and just struggling to get through? Don't it feel that way sometimes? Why? Part of the answer to that why is the belief system, the thinking in our own heads that prevents us from believing God for greater things. 
I hope God has shown you today some areas, some thoughts, some things in your life that you're living out of ungodly beliefs. Maybe believing some ungodly beliefs that are affecting your destiny. Do we have that? I, I know I didn't ask for this, but do we have that? Um, maybe we gave that. Did we give those handouts out last week? Did we do that? Do you have them? I don't have that with me. Anyone have that with them? <laughs> Let me have one. Let me have one. I just want to read it before we go. Quick. Just close with this. A belief system. What is a belief system? If you accept a belief, you reap a thought. You reap a thought, or if you sow a thought, I'm sorry, you reap an attitude. If you sow an attitude, you reap an action. If you reap, or excuse me, if you sow an action, you reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you reap a character, and if you sow a character, you reap a destiny. Amen? Your belief system affects your life. Your life follows your thoughts. Let's pray. Father, we pray in Jesus' name right now and ask, Lord, that you would just, uh, that you would just speak to our hearts. As we seek you in our lives, that you would speak to our hearts about ways of thinking, any place that we have a, a judgment, a vow, an attitude, a belief, a thought that is counter to your word. Speak to us about these things, Lord. Show us how to overcome them. Did we allow them to enter our lives at a time of trauma or hurt? At a time of loss? Did we, uh, did we accept them because of the culture that we live in? Were they things that we were raised with? Generational things that have, have, have entered into our thoughts and our lives and our belief system. Show us these things, Father, and, and, and show us how to repent, how to overcome. Show us how to repent of them and how to recognize when they're affecting our beliefs, when they're affecting our faith walk with you, when they're affecting our, our ability to relate to others, our ability to relate at work, our ability to uh, 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 relate to loved ones and friends. Mostly, Lord, our ability to relate to you, to know your thoughts and your ways. For you told us to transform, to be renewed, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. You told us that and, and to prove what is your perfect and acceptable will. That means, Lord, that we can know many of your ways, many of your thoughts. Teach us. We love you, Father. We bless your name today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, you go with God today. Go with God.